Hi, I'm Les from Tabletop Tastings, and today we're going to learn to play Archaeus Society. Let's do it. To begin, we will prepare our six archaeological dig sites, also known as regions. These are the six boards here. The boards themselves are double-sided. One side has a compass to it, which they're really faint on the boards, but they are there in the left-hand corner. And then at the top left side, on the opposite side, there's an advanced marker. And those stand out really easy. The advanced board sides add game mechanics that make each playthrough unique by adding additional benefits and or challenges. If it's your first playthrough, it's recommended using the red region on its advanced side, Chichen Itza, uh, which we have set up here. Next, we wanna choose six of the 12 rules included with the game to make up our deck. So notice in the box here, we've got 12 different rules. You choose six of those decks, combine them together to make a draw pile. So we've chosen our six decks in this game here, which is the recommended setup for the first playthrough. We've got the botanist, we've got the guide, the photographer, the physician, the pilot, and the student. After you play your first game, the rules include five more scenarios with a focus on each of the remaining regions being placed on their advanced side and the six rules that best pair with them. This can be found in the manual here. So we're playing with the initial setup of Chichen Itza, uh, but the others are all there as well, which show the board on their advanced side and then the six rules based on the symbols that pair best with them. After a few playthroughs, you may find you enjoy mixing the rules up randomly or having players draft the rules in regions. I personally prefer to play with all regions on their advanced sides as I really enjoy what they bring to the game. Each role has its own unique ability and some roles add additional game components. So with our six roles chosen, let's take each of the smaller roll decks, shuffle them up together to form a large deck of cards that can be used for the game. So we've done that here. Then deal one card to each player. I'll take a card. We'll give one to our pretend player over here. And then add one card for each player to the display, plus two additional cards. So we're going to make this our display area here. We're going to do a total of four cards. So that's one for each player. We're pretending we're in a two-player game. And then two additional cards. And if we were playing a six-player game, it would be the same thing. One card for each player, plus two additional for a total of eight cards. After adding the cards to the display, we're gonna split the deck in half and then shuffle all three monkey cards into one of the halves. So here's our deck of all our cards. We'll get them in half and then we're gonna take these three monkey cards and we're gonna shuffle them into one of the halves. Okay. And then we're gonna place the other half of the deck on top of that. And what this does is it guarantees that uh, we're not gonna hit any of the monkey cards until we've gotten through at least half of the deck. And the sole purpose of the monkey cards are to trigger the end of the game. After the third monkey is drawn, the game immediately ends. Now in a two to three player game, the game is played over two seasons, or really they're rounds. Uh, and in a four to six player game, it's played over three seasons, or again, three rounds. Each player chooses a vehicle and places one at the starting position of the left of each of the six tracks, which we've already done here. And we've set up for a two-player game. There may be a few vehicles left over, depending on the roles and regions that you've selected, and that's okay. Uh, if you've got any leftovers, just put them back in the box. Uh, each player would then put their matching marker at the start of the points track. So the game does come with these little cardboard tokens that you could use to keep track of your points. It is kind of nice because there's a 100 point side on them. Uh, so if you cross around the track, you just put the 100 point side up and you keep going around. However, I prefer placing the actual vehicle in the starting marks here because I think it looks better. And then if you go around the track, use the 100 point marker, maybe underneath or instead of your own vehicle. 
And lastly, depending on which rules have been included in our deck, we may need to set up some additional rule-specific components. For example, we're using the botanist, and they have a special botanist frame that we're using, and for now we're just going to set it next to the board. Okay, we're now ready to play. The game suggests the first player be the person who most recently visited an archaeological dig site, but you can really use whatever random method you would like for this process. Players take turns starting with the first player and then proceeding clockwise. And on your turn, you must do one of two actions. Either gain a card or play an expedition. To gain a card, you can take either one card from the draw deck or one card from the face-up display. If drawing from the display, do not replenish any cards there. At the start of your turn, if there are no cards left in the display, when drawing a card from the deck, you may take an additional card for a total of two cards. Please note, you may never have more than 10 cards in your hand, and if you're drawing and you hit 10 cards, you immediately stop drawing cards. So this is kind of nice. If the display is empty, then going forward, you draw two cards from the deck instead of just one. So that's one of the two available actions. So you can choose to either gain a card, or you can choose to play an expedition. An expedition is a card or set of cards that's played from your hand. And each card has two traits. The first is the color. There are six colors, and each of the colors match the colors up at the top of the board. For those who are colorblind, the pattern at the top of the card also matches the pattern of its corresponding color as well. So they're easy to pair up in that way. Second, we have the card roll, which is indicated by the icons in the top left corner, by the picture of the person on the front, and by the ability, which is listed in the bottom right of the card. When playing an expedition, cards must either share all of the same color, which we would have in this example here. There's five cards. The card on top is my expedition leader. They're all the same color, so this would be a five card expedition. Or they can all be of the same role. So in this example here, I've got three cards. I've got the green photographer on top, so that's the leader of my expedition and they all match the same role, so this play would be good. This is a three-player expedition. An expedition could be a single card, or it could be made up of multiple cards. After the expedition is played, if your expedition is large enough, you may advance your vehicle at the site matching your leader's color by one. Check the card requirement to the right of your vehicle's current space to see if you have enough cards to advance. So if I played this expedition here, it's a three-player expedition, the green photographer is my leader. So I find the green board. I see the requirement there is two to advance. I've got more than that. I've got three cards in my expedition. So I meet the minimum two card requirement and I can advance my vehicle up. If I didn't want to play there, for example, I could make the blue card my expedition leader and then I could advance at the blue site by one. If, for example, my vehicle was there. I'm on the green board. If I wanted to advance four, I played this expedition. It's not large enough, so I can't advance. I could still play the expedition, but I'm not going to be able to get my vehicle any further ahead. What I would more likely do in this case is I would flip and have the blue photographer lead so that I could advance on this board over here because the card requirement there is just two. If your expedition is not large enough to advance your vehicle, you can still play the expedition but you won't be able to advance on the track. Sometimes this is necessary, especially later on in the game, as you may have 10 cards in your hand, but not enough of the same color or role to advance on any of the sites that you actually want to. You may also use the effects of your leader's role. So let's review the abilities of each leader selected for the first game. So we have here the botanist. When using the botanist during the game setup, we place the botanist frame near the region site, which we've done already up there. In each round, the person who first plays the botanist expedition immediately gains two points. So if I played the botanist here, I'm the first one to play the botanist. It's an expedition size of one. I'll take the botanist frame, I'll put it up here. I'll immediately score two points for myself. One, two, on the score tracker. Then the next person to play an expedition of equal or larger size would take the, ex the botanist frame from them and place it above of the larger expedition. In this game, whenever we see a black star, it means you score the points immediately. 
Whenever we see a white star, that means we score during the season end. Whoever holds the frame at the end of the season gains an additional two points, and the frame is then returned near the region sites. The guide. For the purpose of advancing your vehicle on the site track, the guide reduces the card requirement size by one. So if a region required two cards in order to advance our vehicle to the next space, we could do it with a single card here. And it's a good example here. Let's say for example, we've got our vehicle here. I could play a single expedition with this one card because it reduces the requirement to advance by one. So I could advance with a single card in my expedition to that next site. Likewise, if we were higher up, say we were over here. If we had three cards and the leader was an expedition, it reduces the requirement from four to three. So we could advance with just three cards as long as the blue guide was the leader. Next, we have the photographer. Now the photographer doesn't have any immediate effect, but she helps with scoring at the end of the round. So when scoring your expedition sizes, the photographer, if she's the leader, scores the expedition as though it had one additional card in it. And we'll talk more about scoring later on. But essentially, at the end of the season, an expedition of three cards that had the photographer in it as its leader would score as if it were a four card expedition. Next, we have the physician. And the physician's great because he heals us in a sense. Normally after an expedition has played all the remaining cards in your hand, go back to the display area. But the physician, if he's your leader, you may keep a number of cards in your hand up to the expedition size and return the rest. For example, if you had an expedition with two cards and the physician was your leader, you could keep up to two cards in your hand instead of having to return them face up to the display. Likewise, if you had five cards in your expedition and the physician was your leader, you could keep up to five cards in your hand. So he's great. Next, we have the pilot. The pilot, if he's our expedition leader, because he's got a plane, he can go essentially anywhere and isn't restricted to advancing that just the region that matches his color. When advancing a site, he can instead advance at any site as long as it's still within the size of the expedition. So great for playing anywhere. And last and definitely least, we have the student. Now, when the student's the leader of an expedition, you cannot advance your vehicle at any site, regardless of the expedition size. So it's best not to use him to lead expeditions. So what does he bring to the table? Well, there are twice as many student cards in their deck than there are for any other role. So the student enables players to create larger expeditions, which score more points at each season's end and can enhance the leader's effects as a result. Those are the six roles we're playing for the beginner game. During setup, we also chose the advanced side of the red region, Chichen Itza. For this archaeological site, whenever a vehicle advances here, you can also draw up to the number of cards shown in that hand symbol. And notice that they're black, so that means you draw immediately. So, if we advanced here by playing an expedition that had at least one card in it and was expedition leader was red, we would then after we've returned all our cards to the face-up display, if we had any, we could then draw one more from the deck. If we advanced here, it's two, so we could draw up to two cards from the deck. When drawing cards here, for this purpose, they're only ever taken from the deck itself, not from the face-up display. So we've played our expeditions, we've advanced in the appropriate sites if able, and we've utilized our role and region abilities. The next step is to return all the cards not used in this expedition from your hand to the display area. So again, you play an expedition, any cards that you haven't used in that expedition get returned face up to the display area. So gameplay continues around the table until the third monkey has been drawn, at which point the round immediately ends and the season end takes place. And whenever anyone draws a monkey, you have to immediately disclose it, and then you draw another card to replace it. At the start of season end, return all unplayed cards from your hand to the deck and all cards in the display back to the deck. Then resolve any season end roll effects. For example, whoever has the botanist frame still would score two points at this point and then returns the frame 
next to the regions. Players gain the number of points shown below their vehicle space in each archaeological site. So for example, if I'm here, I would get one point there. And if I'm over here, I would get two points there. Here I get three points, and here I get seven. So that's one, four, five, six, 13 points. So I would advance my car from two all the way up to 15. It's important to note that vehicles do not reset and continue to advance forward through each season as the game progresses. And the point values typically get higher as we go along. So after each of the seasons, you're going to be scoring more and more points because your vehicles will keep advancing further and further as the game goes on. Then, points are gained based on the size of each expedition played using the chart shown on the scoreboard. I'm just going to flip this up here, but you can see quite nicely that if we have two cards in the expedition, it's worth one point, three cards is worth three, four cards is worth five, five cards is worth eight, six cards is worth twelve. And this is where the photographer comes in. We could have an expedition of just three cards, but if the photographer's in it, we count it as being size four. So she can help you quite a bit with points during this phase. After scoring all expeditions, if it isn't the final round, we then return all the cards to the deck. We're now ready to start the next season and we'll prepare the deck in the exact same way we did for the very first round. We'll deal a new deck to each player, Refill the display with one card for each player, plus two additional. Split the deck, shuffle the three monkeys into the bottom half of the deck, and then whoever drew the third monkey in the previous round and now goes first. The game ends after the final season and the player with the most points wins. In case of a tie, the player with the largest size expedition played during the final season wins. If there's still a tie, all tied players then compare their next largest expedition size, and so on and so forth, until a winner is determined. If all expeditions are identical, which is extremely unlikely, uh, then the game ends in a tie. And that's how you play Archaea Society. Now there are six other rules that we haven't played in this game, along with five other advanced region sides that we haven't touched either. So we'll make a follow-up video to explain the other rules and the other advanced sideboard options. So keep an eye out for those when it comes up. Of course, once they're up, we'll link them within this video. There's also our main show, Tabletop Tastings Episode 1, where Steve and myself play through Archaea Society. We do a ton of stuff wrong, but that's okay. It was a lot of fun. And we paired the perfect whiskey with our playthrough session. We also learned to make a little bourbon Kentucky tea as well. You won't want to miss that. Check it out. Linked at the end of this video. Thanks very much for watching. I'm Les. I hope I've given you a little more. And this is Tabletop Tastings. Learn to play for Archaea Society. Have a great day.